all. Thank you everyone for taking the time to attend um, on what at least in Ithaca, New York is a blizzard currently taking place outside. Um, first, I wanted to say a few words of thanks in particular to um, Mahinder and Cornell University Press that's been helping to organize these. Um, this is the second of a series of Zoom author events that we've been organizing to support some of the initial publications in the book series, Corpus Juris, The Humanities in Politics and Law. Um, um, Antoine Boucher's book, which I'll talk about in a second, is the fourth such publication in that series. I'm gonna show you the first three. Um, we actually have a Zoom author event coming up on March 29, much like this for Bernadette Myler's Theaters of Pardon. So um, the press will also send out announcements for that. Um, and we have our fifth publication coming out in March. Um, in any case, today we're gonna be discussing, of course, Antoine Vaucher's The Neoliberal Republic, Corporate Lawyers, Statecraft, and the Making of Public-Private France. Um, but to say one other small world word about Corpus Juris um, um, and additional thanks attached to that. Um, Corpus Juris, for people who aren't aware of it, is a book series that is focused on law and humanities work uh, that's housed at Cornell University Press, but also at Cornell University, um, and is really a testament to Cornell's support for interdisciplinary scholarship and inter interdisciplinary work on law. Um, we have a number of faculty who are affiliated by way of the board, um, Chantal Thomas, Aziz Rana, Jason Frank, Nelson Tebby, and Kemi Robsis, who's now at Columbia. And it's also been supported by Cornell Law School, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Society for the Humanities. So um, thanks as well to that um, support. Um, so what I'll do is uh, first introduce Antoine, who's going to be offering a response to our three commentators um, after they speak. And since I know the nature of Zoom events is pe for people to drop in and out, I'm going to introduce each of our three commentators immediately before their remarks, um, just so that people who are joining midway um, can, can hear that. Um, but to get us started, um, Antoine Vaucher is a CNRS research professor in political sociology and law at the Centre European de Sociologie et de Sciences Politiques at the University of Paris and the Sorbonne. He's also a permanent visiting professor at i Research Center at the University of Copenhagen. Um, his research engages with historical sociology, political sociology, and critical sociology of law focusing on the international interactions between forms of expertise, transnational knowledge communities, and transnational politics with an emphasis on the European Union. Over the years, he's been a visiting scholar in a variety of universities. He's been a postdoctoral fellow at the American Bar Association at Northwestern, a Marie Curie fellow at the Robert Schumann Center, a senior Amy Noel fellow at NYU, and a visiting professor at Amsterdam University, Bocconi University, Copenhagen University, Columbia, the Luis in Rome, Cairo University, and the International Institute for the Sociology of Law in Spain. Um, among his many publications, most recent is a series of four books on law, politics, and democracy in the European Union. Those books um, include a monograph that provides a renewed narrative of Europe's legal in integration titled Brokering Europe, Euro Lawyers, and the Making of a Transnational Polity. It's, in, it's available in a number of languages. Um, an edited volume on the transnational field of European law called Lawyering Europe, European Law as a Transnational Legal Field. The essay Democratizing Europe, and fourth being an intervention book with Thomas Piketty, Stephanie Annette, and Guillaume Sacrist titled Pour un traité de démocratisation de l'Europe, which has been translated into nine languages. I feel like this is like um, a moment of reckoning for my breaking of one of my pandemic um, vows, which was to actually finally master my French pronunciation. So in a couple of minutes, I'll get to embarrass myself again. Um, in any case, um, today we're discussing his most recent book, um, 
which was originally published in French as Fair Public, Entaré Privé, Enquête sur un Grand Voyage, um, and is translated as the Neoliberal Republic. Um, and let me move on to introduce our first commentator. Um, Samuel Moyne is Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University. He received a doctorate in modern European history from the University of California, Berkeley and a law degree from Harvard. Before moving to Yale, he taught at Harvard in both the law school and department of history. And before that at Columbia, he's written several books in his uh, many fields. Those include The Last Utopia, Human Rights and History, more recently, he's published Christian Human Rights, which was based on the Mellon Distinguished Lectures at the University of Pennsylvania, and Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. He has the forthcoming book titled, if I'm right, Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, which will be out, when will that be out? Uh, September. Oh, fantastic. Um, he's also um, done some really important work as an editor, for instance, he co-founded and for a decade served as the co-editor of the journal Humanity and for seven years of the journal Modern Intellectual History. Um, I'm gonna stop there even though I could go on so that we have time to discuss um, Antoine's book. Um, so thank you, Sam, if you wanna get us started. Excellent. Um, well, to begin with, congratulations uh, to Antoine. It's really a, a privilege to be here, and, and even more, it was a, a, an extraordinary privilege to get to read the English translation early and write a brief forward. Um, uh, actually, because I've done that, I'm, I'm really going to be brief and ask a few questions, really. Um, I'll add, you know, congratulations to Liz, uh, this series uh, is, uh, I, I find, you know, thrilling. And uh, I've, uh, I've, I've attended one of the last uh, events around Judith Circus's book, and I know this one will be as exciting. Um, so Antoine, uh, Antoine's book with uh, Pierre France is, I, I found, uh, you know, absorbing and major. Uh, and in part, that's because I've, you know, another way of, you know, more deflationary way of, of telling my bio than Liz chose is that I personally have kind of lost track of France in, in recent years and not been there for a while, actually. So this was an opportunity to kind of um, think about how uh, authors like Antoine and, and Pierre France are, are integrating it into um, some scholarship with which I am familiar. And it's really in that vein that I want to ask a few questions um, about um, where Antoine might see it in the, the literature on so-called neoliberalism. First, I want to ask a question that it doesn't reach that, um, that kind of, you know, uh, inquiry, just because I'm curious um, for him to say a little bit more about um, how the work came to be. Um, at the empirical core of, of this uh, fantastic study is um, some, you know, let's call it ethnography um, work around corporate lawyers. The appendix tells us um, sort of how, how, it, how it came about that the, the co-authors decided to, um, you know, do that empirical work, which is, you know, fantastic. And even in my two page forward, I cite a couple of what I would call tidbits that really stand out from um, that survey. But I also um, wondered if to begin with Antoine might reflect on um, what, what the benefits and costs of centering corporate lawyers, um, you know, was in, in thinking about um, building a story of the state. I also think that um, question is relevant in, now that I'm going to frame a few questions about neoliberalism, because corporate lawyers are 
are some actors amongst others uh, in, in building not just a general account of the French state, which the book uh, purports to do, uh, and I think does very well, but um, also in building an account of, of neoliberalism. So I've, turning to those questions, I first want to note in fairness that this book, um, let's say, isn't frontally, certainly in its first edition, framed around neoliberalism studies, even though my forward tries to, you know, you know, it, 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 in, encourage it to, or think about it in that frame. Now, in my defense, um, uh, the, the title, which, you know, Liz beautifully read out in, in French, was changed by someone else before I saw it. And uh, so I guess the following questions are sort of asking Antoine how he would defend the retitling, which I hope is an intellectual and not just a, a marketing choice. And once we take the new title seriously, the neoliberal republic, you know, what, what we might learn about the general phenomenon, um, especially when we begin kind of compare some kind of comparative thinking, which uh, again, defensively Antoine, you know, doesn't entirely undertake in the course of this book. Um, so, you know, the first, the first, you know, question in this regard would have to do with um, the explanation of comparative French distinctiveness, um, you know, to, to get at that fully, um, it, it would require, you know, an, another uh, intellectual agenda that would be more explicitly comparative. Um, but on the one hand, there are some remarks on this, you know, to on this score in the book. And second, I just inferred in reading it last spring or whenever I wrote the foreword that um, that th there was a, a kind of commitment to a distinctively republican trajectory in France that a, France that accounts for some of the distinctiveness of its version of a neoliberal state or state non-state nexus. Um, and I just like, you know, to ask Antoine if, if that's right um, and um, what else he might want to say about it. Um, there, there is a footnote um, in which Antoine defines uh, ne neoliberalism, you know, kind of, you know, accepts the certain amount of diffusion uh, around its definition, but still owns um, the, the term. And I assume that footnote was in the French version, even if, you know, it that the word neoliberalism hadn't been Ill elevated to the title. But then I think we're entitled to ask whether the thesis is, is about the effect of kind of France's longstanding Republican tradition on, um, you know, uh, on, on the form of, of neoliberalism in, in the French case. Okay, second, I just wonder, you know, however Antoine comes down on that matter, what he might want to hazard um, in thinking about cross national comparisons. Um, now this would go beyond the, the limits of the book, but you know, it's fair to put pressure on authors and in, in that regard, even so. Um, you know, I began thinking, you know, for example, of Raymond Plant's famous book, The Neoliberal State, which does have a title reminiscent of this one, you know, doesn't feature any emphasis on Republican traditions uh, in, in the British past uh, or recent past. But I, I wonder, you know, whether taking that book or just as a general matter, given the reading I'm sure Antoine, like the rest of us has done uh, in, in the neoliberalism literature, what, whether, um, what, what it might look like to connect the, the, the brilliant kind of inquiry of this book, which is kind of Franco-Francais um, in, in a more comparative vein. 
So the the second to last question I want to ask in in this vein um, really has to do with how um, Antoine thinks about um, the 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 stability of the outcomes in this case. So you know one way of of interpreting the picture that he and his co-author mount of a kind of um, interesting privatizing but still public uh, state is that it's it's let's say the effect of a republican hangover uh, in 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 a, in an era of transit of neoliberal transition or you might put it another way and say that many of the French men and women in the study have a Republican super ego that lead them not just to frame, but to live out neoliberalism in a distinctive way, but it's transitional. It's actually a kind of transitory phenomenon that uh, the, the experience and the effects of neoliberalism is dissolving. And so we might well wonder if the neoliberal republic as, as something of a contradiction in terms or maybe an oxymoron is, is stable or instead whether it's, uh, you know, it's, it's set for some expiration to the extent that it, 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 it actually has, has the effects that Antoine, I mean, you know, brutally, I think, uh, illustrates in the book. So last question, you know, concerns what we might do on the basis of this account or what, what you know, those with, with uh, you know, connected to movements and with access to, you know, reform possibilities in France might do um, in the face of the public-private erosion that is, you know, really wonderfully depicted in the book. And I guess um, in quickly rereading the, 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 the last part of the study, um, I once again really liked the um, argument that Antoine and Pierre France make a, a in, in the vein of Michael Walzer about the need for an art of separation. Uh, and, and you know, if, if Antoine needs to explain what that argument was more, I'll let him do it. What I wondered is whether Antoine's own um, kind of prescriptions themselves reflect a kind of Republican hangover or superego in the sense that um, it seems like the call at the end of the book is for a neo-Republican turn. Um, making the state the state again uh, and and getting back the the state as the agent allegedly of course uh, of the res publica rather than intérêt privé private interests which have come to let's say colonize the state um, and I guess my query about that is is it up to the challenge uh, we've seen so many Republican turns in France, at least in French intellectual history, notably in the 1980s, when everyone and his brother and sister uh, was claiming the, you know, to the need to transcend a previously, you know, much touted liberalism in the name of Republican values and so forth and so on. And if that's the remedy, it I, I wonder if it can suffice to enact the separation um, or even whether separation is the right way of conceiving of the remedy. So once again, congrats to Liz, congrats especially to Antoine and Pierre France, and thanks for letting me talk. Many thanks, Sam. Um, a wonderful way to get us um, and the conversation started. Um, and again, is it, I think it makes sense to gather all of the comments and then give Antoine a chance to respond at the end. Um, um, next, we'll be hearing from Mitchell Lasser, who is Jack G. Clark Professor of Law at Cornell Law School, where he is also Director of Graduate Studies, as well as of the Cornell Summer Institute of International and Comparative Law, 
Once Upon a Time in Paris, um, we'll see, <laughs> um, not this year, um, before joining the faculty at Cornell. Um, Professor Lasser taught at the University of Utah. Um, he received a JD from Harvard and a PhD in comparative literature from Yale. Um, he's also been a Fulbright scholar, a visiting professor at the University of Paris 1, the University of Lausanne, the University of Geneva, um, NYU School of Law, and the Institut d'études politiques de Paris. Um, he's also um, been a chair at the European University Institute in Florence and a visiting professor at Yale Law School. Um, I'll simply talk about his three books. His first was titled Judicial Deliberations, a Comparative Analysis of Judicial Transparency and Legitimacy. Um, this was the subject of a collected books of, book of essays called The Legitimacy of Highest Courts Rulings, published uh, by The Hague and distributed by Cambridge. His second monograph is titled Judicial Transformations, The Rights Revolution in the Courts of Europe. And his third um, is not available on his website yet, so I had to get it out, um, is titled um, Judicial Disappointments, Judicial Appointments Reform and the Rise of Judicial European Judicial Independence. Um, and I'll hand the floor over to Mitchell. Thank you, Liz, and uh, uh, hi, everybody. Thanks, Antoine. Um, I think um, what I'd like to do is to start with a, a bold statement, um, and that is that Antoine's book is um, worth reading not once, not, not twice, but four times. Um, and uh, that's, not, that's not because I'm his copy editor, I'm not his copy editor, but I've, I've read it four times. Uh, first, when it came out in France three, four years ago, for the simple reason that I read more or less everything that he writes. A second time, a couple of years ago, when the question arose whether uh, it might make sense to translate and publish it in English. I can't say that that was a terribly difficult question to answer. Um, a third time for a joint book event uh, this past fall and fourth this time around. Um, uh, now, I, I know it's supposed to be a serious occasion, but let me say that the book um, continues to leave me cackling with delight at every turn. Um, I suspect that the reasons for this might not be entirely obvious for those of you who don't spend their lives playing on or around the field of the high French state. Um, so I, I thought it might be best to try to ground my comments by talking about a particular representative of the French administrative state of the type that Antoine analyzes in his book. Um, let's call him Dupont. Um, I was first introduced uh, to Dupont in 2006 over a lunch set up for me by Christophe Jamin who had just arrived at Sciences Po, he wasn't yet dean. Um, I was working on a book on how the um, European Court of Human Rights was handing down a series of judgments that were forcing the Conseil d'État and the Cour de Cassation to alter their time-honored decision-making practices, which had long empowered their judges to debate and resolve their cases amongst themselves with little or no meaningful input by the litigants, or any other civil society actors for that matter. Dupont was a commissaire du gouvernement at the Conseil d'État. In other words, exactly the kind of person that Antoine is describing in his book. Um, he was 40, rail thin, with grinning eyes that simultaneously expressed self-mockery and self-importance. Um, the perfect, super high-grade, Inarch being groomed for leadership positions within the Conseil d'État, and thus by definition, the French state. And indeed, he joined the Conseil d'État when he was like 26. By 30, he was on loan from the Conseil d'État to work in the cabinet of the Secrétaire général du gouvernement, one of the key offices attached to the prime minister, at the time, center right, um, Edouard Balladur then headed by the towering figure of Jean-Marc Sauvé, who was about to become head of the Conseil d'État. So we're talking here about the very inner, inner sanctum of the French state. 
And there was Dupont explaining to me how he was advising his colleagues at the Conseil d'État to handle the annoying judgments of an ill-informed European Court of Human Rights, which were threatening to undermine the all-important and time-honored decisional procedures and institutional prerogatives of the Conseil d'État. Okay, fast forward five years, now 2011. I'd had a few minor exchanges with Dupont over the intervening years, but nothing significant. And then out of the blue, I receive a letter at the office from a fancy French law firm. I should say, I, I never get letters from French law firms. Um, Brodin Prat, to be precise, um, originally founded by uh, Badente, who was going to become the chief justice of the French Conseil Constitutionnel. Rather precious looking stationery by American standards, I have to say. I open it. It has a sheet of thick, waxy, semi-transparent paper revealing underneath the big news. Cher collègue, we're writing to announce the hiring of our newest partner, Dupont of the Conseil d'État, who will run our firm's new public law division. It was a mass mailing, nothing personal at all. And I remember looking at that bit of publicity literature and wondering, what the fuck? <laughs> what on earth is Dupont clearly on the fast track to super high leadership positions at the very heart of the French state and frankly, already largely there? What on earth is he doing joining some Parisian law firm? According to the grand tradition, he's supposed to run the Conseil d'État or a division thereof, or run ministries, or parachute into leadership of Elf Aquitaine or Crédit Agricole Bank or some other traditionally state affiliated quasi private entity. But join a bland Parisian law firm? It's the world upside down. Well, um, it took a few years. But Antoine's book explains it all. OK, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I'd like to call attention to how Antoine goes about his business, um, how he tries to decipher and make sense of the changes exemplified by Dupont's otherwise puzzling career decision. One, um, and here um, it's echoing Sam a little bit. In time-honored socio-ethnographic manner, Antoine does a deep dive into the nitty-gritty of daily life, routine processes, personal and institutional encounters, and so on. I find that kind of work inherently delicious. Of course, he, he needs data, uh, and that poses problems. He can't really go native precisely because the Conseil d'État is such an exclusive club whose rights of membership preclude access even to the likes of Antoine. So he, he uses alternative means to gather information on the migration of his functionaries of the state, like Dupont, to the private sector. And for this, he uses the law firm's own websites and literature, which tout their hiring and regulatory victories as a means of staying afloat in the competitive market for their services. And then he uses interviews as a means of gaining access to the reigning and frankly self-serving professional ideologies of his cast of characters who in constructing their own operative professional space generate a conceptual and ideological framework that rationalizes and auto justifies their own emergent power. Two, he offers what's ultimately a strongly constructivist account that's embedded in the particular semi-contemporary history of the French transformations he's describing. It's a story that really flows from the Mitterrand and Chirac periods, often cohabitation periods, of the late 80s and 90s, when mass privatization increasingly put an end to straightforward top-down French governmental command and control over France's leading industries. With the gradual rise of the regulatory state that followed, often strongly inflected by EU 
free movement demands, a new relationship was formed not only between the public and private and between the French and the European, but also between the actors operating at the complex and shifting intersection between them. So Antoine's book is really an in-depth account of the rise of this cast of characters, of the role definitions that they came to mold for themselves, of the professional mores and practices that they gradually instituted, of the institutions they built and populated, and of the ideologies they came simultaneously to construct and to internalize. Three, finally, deeply related, Antoine's account is ardently non-binary. He doesn't offer simple inversions. It's not that the previous domination by the French state and by the public sphere has been replaced with a domination by corporations and the private sphere. It's not that the old dominant ideology of the general interest has been supplanted by one of the private interest. It's not that the French have suddenly adopted the infamous American revolving door between industry and government. Nor is it that the classic French noblesse d'état has been replaced by the French Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, right? Instead, it's that those same characters like Dupont now live and work at the intersection of the Republic's key institutions and the private law firms with which, and often now in which and through which they work. It's that the general interest has been reconstructed in a manner that allows French governmental insiders to leave for Parisian corporate law firms and to do work there that they themselves sincerely, if self-servingly understand as advancing that general interest. It's the Republic morphed, right? Um, it's a one, it's a story that really makes it that you can't really tell the difference between public and private, between corporate interest and general interest, between contract and regulation, between law firm and French administrative state and so on. It's an unnerving story of muddling. It's hard to tell who's who and what's what and why. That's hard for the researcher to access and analyze and it's hard for politics to consider and address. It's a version of the deep state so amorphous and protean that you can't quite figure out if it's terrifying or banal. Of course, it could be both. Right? Um, to conclude, what are we to make of the fact, um, and this is a question, I guess, for Antoine, what are we to make of the fact that Dupont launched recently the World Pact for the Environment, that President Macron brought to the United Nations, and that formed the basis of international negotiations launched by a 2018 resolution of the UN's General Assembly? Maybe this is a happy story. <laughs> Lord knows, maybe, maybe Antoine does. So I'd love to get his reaction. Final question. And it involves how to speak of the present in the context of the past. Um, how do you find yourself handling the difficult task of critiquing the current state of affairs without romanticizing the good old days when the Conseil d'État straightforwardly administered the French state and its key public-private institutions in the name of the Republic, right? Okay, thanks Antoine for four great reads, one book. <laughs> Thank you, Mitchell, for those, um, for those comments. Um, and our last respondent um, is Katerina Pistor, who is Edwin B. Parker, Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia Law School. Um, to briefly recap some of her scholarship, um, she's the co-author or, or the author or co-author of nine books. Her most recent book, The Code of Capital, 
how the law creates wealth and inequality, examines how assets such as land, private debt, business organizations, or knowledge are transformed into capital through contract law, property rights, collateral law, and trust corporate and bankruptcy law. The Code of Capital was named one of the best books of 2019 by the Financial Times and Business Insider. Um, one um, to focus on other of her work, her recent essay from territorial to monetary sovereignty um, was published in the journal on theoretical inquiries in law and argues that the rise of a global monetary system means a new definition of sovereignty, the control of money. She served on the editorial boards of Journal of Institutional Economics, European Business Organization Law Review, American Journal of Comparative Law, and Columbia Journal for European Law. She's also a prominent commentator on cryptocurrency and has testified before Congress on the lack of regulatory oversight on an international level. Before joining Columbia, she held teaching and research positions at Harvard Law School, the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, and the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Law in Hamburg. She's been a visiting professor at University of Pennsylvania Law School, NYU Law School, Frankfurt University, London School of Economics, and Oxford. And I'll stop there and give the floor over to Katerina for our um, third set of remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful event. And again, thank you, um, Antoine and Pierre for uh, writing the book and sharing it with us. I think it's a really, it's a great book and I learned a ton from it. I also want to say that I really appreciate the fact that you put the lawyers up front and center. Um, I tried this to do this in my own book, um, but I think there are interesting um, comparisons here. And this goes to Sam's earlier point. How do we compare different systems? What struck me is that in both systems, um, the Anglo-Saxon systems and the continental systems, and we're taking France as the prime example here, the question about sort of the public and the private, of course, has been at the center of much of the neoliberal debates. But I would argue that in the Anglo-Saxon world, we've always said sort of the market is the pure thing and the state better stay out of it. And in a way, you know, one could read your book and your argument to say, well, there is such a thing as a pure public sphere and the market better stays out of there, out of it. What is interesting, I think, in both systems, we have seen the blurring of the lines. And um, I'm not sure what this exactly tells us, what it mean, whether it means that um, you know, the, the liber neoliberal project is advancing, uh, but it certainly is advancing in different ways, in different societies. It's adapting to the pre-existing constitu um, institutions and practices. And, and that I think is fascinating. And I, I, I would echo uh, the call that others have made before that we do need more comparative research of this kind. Um, I should say that I try to read, read a little bit up on um, uh, French lawyers, German lawyers, etc. in the age of globalization. My sense from those readings was that the transformation of the legal profession in France went hand in hand with globalization. What I find interesting in your book, I think you trace this to earlier events, back to the 1960s, when the first law firm started to become the kind of more professional, broad ranging firms that they have been in the Anglo-Saxon world for some time. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to, to uh, think a little bit harder where this comes from in different legal systems and how it kind of converges. Um, uh, my reading also is that uh, the Anglo-Saxon firms or the, the merged firms uh, or those who have basically then bought up French firms um, and, 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 and made them bigger, et cetera, in, um, that is an important part of the story as well. You mentioned Clifford Chan, some of the other big global players. So I think that's, that's, that's part of it. But the core point really that I wanted to emphasize is that sort of the blurring of the lines happens in both systems. We're starting, we, we're analyzing it from different perspectives. And I do agree that there is something about the public that needs to be preserved, especially if we want to take democratic self-governance seriously, right? Um, but I would also um, re-emphasize what others have asked before, Mitchell in particular, is whether we should uh, um, romanticize the past or whether there's something to which we really want to return, um, especially in France, I would say, because sort of this, um, I'm not sure whether the old system really reflects what you talk about when you talk about 
democracy and the public sphere, whether this is really this really was the place where people self governed, or whether this was not always a, a major elite project an elite project that now has been captured by slightly different forces, but has always been captured uh, by some as most sort of of the um, you know, consolidated, concentrated uh, spheres of power might be. Um, I'm, I'm also reading, I haven't um, finished it yet, but I'm reading um, Ellen Landemore's book about open democracy. And her argument is basically is that the res representative model of uh, democracy has failed, or at least is sort of, um, uh, is up for a major update. And I'm just wondering about as we move forward, whether we should embrace a deeper reconsideration um, of, of, of the state. Which really brings me to a last a, 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 um, couple of points I wanted to make just to think beyond the framework that you introduce. One is um, how to think about the state and how to think about sort of this, um, this domain or field <laughs> that the spa state is and how it is being and has always been reconfigured in real time. So there, it's not just being blurred. I think the neoliberal project, we've always seen sort of a reconfiguration. So that I think requires a little bit more um, uh, attention in general in comparative um, research. But beyond that, I'm also thinking about about your book in relationship to some of the arguments that my colleague Charles Sable has made uh, together with others, Josh Cohen or Jonathan Zeitlin, who have portrayed the European Union project, interestingly enough, not so much as a neoliberal project as, as you also seem to do, but also as an experimentation in new forms of governance. And they call this new governance. And they call for problem solving that involves both public and private players basically arguing that these old models of this is the state and an administrative state with its own expertise just cannot work anymore in a highly complex world. It requires actually collaboration and, 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 uh, um, and actually the crossing of this boundary between the public and the private to solve problems together. Now, I think one could also argue in the most positive reading, that's what they try to do, or this is something that the European Union also in, embraced to some extent, but this, this very project has been captured by the lawyers that you described and other powerful intermediaries who were able sort of to go and take this niche, this new space that opened up and, and, and use it for its own purposes. But underneath there, I think, is a really fundamental problem. And that is that the complex societies that we find ourselves in, I would argue, can no longer be governed in the way that the classic Republican model might have done that. Um, the complexity of problems when you think about financial regulation, antitrust, um, the new technologies, the state doesn't have the capacity. And here, let me just sort of maybe finish with one question or perhaps also a little bit of a challenge. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with um, Matthias Thiemann's work. Um, he's a German sociologist who teaches at Sciences Po. He got his PhD, uh, you're saying he has his PhD at Columbia. I was on his, on his committee at the time and I've been in touch with him since. He makes a really interesting argument about France when he talks about shadow banking. And his argument is that in France, the regulators of accounting rules and financial uh, organizations were both hands on, they knew what was going on in that sector. And because they were not regulating a particular sec segment of financial intermediaries, but a broad range of issues, they were also sufficiently autonomous not to be completely captured by them. And makes the case that ultimately in comparison to the Netherlands or Spain or Germany, France was the best regulator when it came to shadow banking system. They made sure that these special purpose vehicles did not bring down the financial system as badly. <laughs> France was also affected of course, but not as badly as in the neighboring countries. At least they didn't allow that market to, to increase so much. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether this is a side story or whether Matthias has picked up something in a new con reconfiguration of the public and the private that might be worth investigating or that might have parallels in other spheres of public regulation and, and, and this space between the public and the private. But let me stop here. Thank you, everyone. And I'll, we'll give Antoine um, some time to respond. And after that, we will open up the floor to audience questions. Okay. So don't hesitate to be thinking if there are questions you'd like to pose. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liz. And I have to say, first of all, I, I feel very, very lucky and um, and um, and grateful to all of you for taking the time to read and making so um, challenging uh, questions. And um, I mean, this is the best situation any author can uh, imagine. Um, I would like to thank also Liz, of course, because I think uh, this new book series is really uh, what any, you know, critical legal sociologist is uh, hoping for, you know, the sort of a space, interdisciplinary space. There are not that many, so this is really, um, it's been a very nice process of editing, but also um, it's a very, I mean, I, I'm very happy to see that this, this um, this book series is so um, is so is developing so so so, so well. So thank you, Liz, and um, also for uh, taking the time to to set up this very um, nice um, discussion. So I have many questions. I don't know if I were able to to uh, get to all of them. Maybe I should start with the the title, uh, the title one uh, that Sam uh, started with because um, there is indeed a different title from the French version, uh, Sphere Publique Intérêt Privé. And the more, you know, somehow striking title of the, the English version, uh, the Neoliberal -Lib Republic, which sounds almost like a sort of a Star Wars uh, movie uh, title. So, I mean, I, but in a way, um, um, I have to say that there are almost two years have passed ever since uh, my uh, the book was published in, in actually in France, and um, I wouldn't have chosen the title at the time uh, in the French version because I was not entirely sure of what I was describing. I mean, of course, I could see the field mounting progressively in the state. I mean, the field of public-private actors. Um, I could see that, you know, some reform themes, reform agenda around competition, particularly, was progressively moving. I could, of course, count the, you know, the lawyers moving across and in and out of the state. But it's really with Macron that, in a way, uh, the whole process became to be political in the sense that entered the political field. And that, in a way, the sort of tension between the neoliberal agenda and the republic, you know, as being as become in a way most uh, most uh, striking. So, I think it's more, you know, that the, the sort of process that has been evolving in the meantime that made me a little bit more sure, or made me more secure that it was actually the the right the right process. And I feel now much more, um, um, you know, um, confident that. Indeed, the process uh, of uh, entering of Macron in politics is very much um, a sort of outcome uh, of a variety of elites uh, in and out of the states, uh, particularly Le Grand Corps from top civil servants who have been leading neoliber the neoliberalization of France for the past 20 years. And of course, uh, actors ruling uh, elite of the um, firms uh, acting with the state, exchanging with the state. This sort of milieu that I'm trying to describe, in a way, as found in Macron, a sort of um, you know political hero, um, unexpected in a way, um, who's been able to um, to build this sort of uh, uh, neoliberal agenda that up until now was always uh, had difficulties in uh, fully being fully embraced by political parties, uh, whether uh, from the left or for the right. And here comes with Macron in a way, a sort of uh, full uh, endorsement of that agenda of pro-market, pro-competition, pro-European agenda. And this somehow made me more confident. But then of course, the question is, to what extent France is distinctive in that uh, story? I mean, initially, my idea was, in a way, the contrary. I mean, my idea was um, to write a, a narrative to explain um, the rise of uh, uh, neoliberalism in, Fran in the French state, not as something against which les grands corps, the top civil servants, were resisting, you know, somehow under sieged 
by the Europeanization process, under siege by you know neoliberal turn of the other member member states of the European Union, but as as something that had been somehow co-produced by from within the state and from within top civil servants, and in particular from the the, the Conseil d'État. And so my account, in a way. Um, would like to run counter the idea that you know there there was something uh, extremely distinctive about you know um, a, a resist a, a French state and French state elite who which would have been an, in in a way reluctant or resistant. I think fragments of the elite in, in the state, but I try to identify with you know the sort of sociology of the moving across the private and the public which you know, map out within the state, which uh, uh, segments of the state have been actually pushing for uh, um, this uh, pro-competition, pro-market uh, remaking of the state in a way. So, but there is still, of course, something specific indeed about uh, a distinctive maybe uh, about the, the, this process and the fact that it is you know, happening in France um, and in a way, you, you singled it out very nicely, I think, uh, Sam, in your uh, of the book. Um, I think it's somehow the, the need that is felt uh, among these uh, state elites that move in and out of the state to um, rationalize or produce uh, rationalizations of this moving in terms of public interest in terms of public spiritedness of their move. So this sort of uh, urge they feel that there's a need to be in continuity with the story, la grande histoire de l'état, you could say, in, 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 of the strong state, etc. So in a way, um, yes, there is something distinctive about uh, this uh, amount of production um, you know, in think tanks, in articles, um, where these um, um, movers uh, in and out of the state, you know, try to, you know, build a sort of public legitimacy for this new partnership between uh, business or market actors and, and the state. In that sense, um, I think what I'm doing uh, is not, of course, uh, comparative enough. Um, it's a frustration. I, it's a limit, clearly, of the book, um, which um, could have been more thought from the beginning as a comparative project. And this is a regret, I guess. But at the same time, I think precisely because it is distinctive in that sense, um, uh, it, it's, it is distinctive in the sense that we're talking about a, a state which el whose elite um, are trying to build new rational, new rash uh, public rationalizations of uh, this partnership, of the public-private partnership, in terms of even empowerment of the re-empowerment of the state through market instruments through neoliberal policies. So what is interesting, I think, is this sort of combination, which I think is very original, but not, uh, exclu not, not exclusively French. In a way, you could think in terms of uh, ideal types in the Weberian way. I think with this sort of very specific story, I think we can look back then to other countries and even you know, look at the European Central Bank and the way the European Central Bank is building, for example, you know, sense of its public legitimacy in the crisis as a very swift and agile market player. So how you combine, you know, uh, public legitimacy to uh, being a private, you know, in, in, in and in the, uh, uh, or embedded in market, inter in market um, rules, et cetera. So in that sense, I think it, it is pro providing or try, you know, something that could help comparative work. I hope, um, I hope, you know, some of the readers might uh, be interested in, in doing that and I'll be happy to, to, to work with them because I think there's, there's still a lot of work to do here. But, but in that sense, I think it is uh, maybe in a way, because it is extreme, if you want, 
because it is uh, it is showing something that that allows us to understand other realities outside of uh, outside of France. At least, I'd hope for that. Um, moving on on to other uh, other questions um, um, and 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 a sort of provocation by Sam, I think of. Do I have also sort of a super Republican ego or super ego Republican? And I like the expression. Um, and a little bit, I think that's what also Mitch and Katharina said, you know, uh, talking about the sort of nostalgia that maybe runs in the book, uh, which I try to fight against in a way, um, because I think uh, the 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 strong state of the 1950s and stick and, and and 60s of course was a very elitist and if you were if you want paternalist uh, state and uh, what I'm trying to point out is that precisely these uh, grand corps these top civil servants um, being the first somehow benefiters of this new deal with the business sector being very much, you know, the co-producers of this remaking of the state. I think uh, they cannot be any more thought as, you know, somehow the, the guardians of the general interest. I mean, in that sense, I have no nostalgia at all. Um, and I mean, I, at some point I say we should forget nostalgia, I think. Uh, because a lot of the political left is, of course, uh, about this nostalgia about the 1960s and 70s when the French state was indeed uh, interventionist and strong. I think, um, I think, however, what we need, and, you know, and the book, in a way, points at that, is um, um, a set uh, um, a sense of um, a care of self of the state. Um, one of my colleagues, Philippe Bezès in France, uses that Foucauldian expression of care of self and to use it for the state itself, you know, in the sense that the state, you know, should, uh, the state and, the, uh, and you know, us as um, citizens should somehow feel concerned about, you know, what is happening at the border between the public and, and the private. Um, because it's not any border um, uh, that, um, that we have here. Uh, it's a border, of course, uh, of democracy. Because what is public and what can symbolically be uh, entitled as public, you know, public money um, or, uh, you know, public policy, um, is something that has, uh, on which there is a, a, a sense of democratic uh, uh, sovereignty. So if the border between the public and the private becomes blurred, uh, then I think it's you know, somehow the defense of the autonomy of democracy and the defense of the autonomy of um, um, democratic institutions that is um, at, uh, in, in danger. So that's, that's, that's the reason why I, I think this public-private border should be considered as um, something we should be looking at, something we should be, uh, we should be developing knowledge um, about that. And the state doesn't have so far a systematic understanding of what is happening at its border, who is moving in and out. Uh, what sort of um, functions are, are outsourced or, or what sort of partnerships are happening? You know, I think it's not only in France, but we're getting aware that, you know, there's, there's hardly a, a sort of common, a, a hardly a, a, a knowledge of, um, uh, again, what is happening at the border between the public and the private. So in that sense, I think the care of self of the state um, is uh, a key element uh, that is not just a key element for civil servants uh, or for people working with the state, but I think of a variety of, you know, of, of all citizens in a way to, to, um, to a certain uh, extent. Um, 
then uh, also to to um, well, I mean, to Mitch uh, and you know, on the good old days, I've tried to 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 address the the, the issue. Uh, I think I've I've singled out, of course, who the lawyer is, um, uh, which I won't, of course, say. Um, but and and he's been in, indeed very active in the recent years on on while still a lawyer though still a corporate lawyer um, in pushing for this environmental pact. Um, I think this is exactly indeed what I'm trying to describe. I mean, they're not lawyers in the sense that they're market actors. They are they are lawyers. Uh, as I say in French, tout contre l'État, against the state. You know, at the same time playing against the state, but very side by side with the state. And uh, this uh, from former guy, uh, you know, man from the Conseil d'État, is typical of that. Who is actually at the same time a corporate lawyer, but of course keeps keeps a lot of professional and symbolic ties with the with the the, the state and the idea of his work as uh, pursuing the general interest. So I don't think, I mean, this is typically the sort of figure I'm trying to describe. They, they, don't, they don't think of themselves as having become private uh, actors. They think of themselves as uh, continuing um, the, the great story of the French state, but through new partnership with business uh, actors and, um, uh, and and new career moves outside of the state and particularly in, in, in law firms. So of course, um, uh, there should be um, a comparison as, as, as Katharina, you, you were, uh, you were um, suggesting uh, um, that there could be a very nice comparison on you know, um, the transformation of legal professions. I think one common point of continental legal professions, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the American one is that, um, I think Mark Oziel uh, told that uh, in a very nice review um, 20 years ago um, on the history uh, of legal professions in, 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 um, in, in the Western world. Um, is the fact that uh, in the continental Europe, there has been an historic distance with market um, and market actors in, and, and the profession has built itself in a way um, with a lot of rules um, and a lot of impediments and incompatibilities with playing at the same time the as a prof legal professional and as uh, you know, a board member in companies or other sorts of, uh, um, you know. So in, in that sense, I think there is something specific about, um, about the legal profession in, um, in, continental, uh, um, in, content, in continental Europe in, in, a, in a way, of course. Um, <clears throat> and that, that is also why, I mean, that sense that the legal profession has to do has something to do with disinterestedness, disinterestedness, uh, made it, I think, also easier for politicians and uh, top civil servants to move in the legal profession. The, the, the idea that they were not just uh, market players, uh, but that they had some sort of novelty, uh, a little bit the way the state novelty, you know, had its own, of, of own prestige. I think um, made it easier, and, and and indeed, when politicians that move to the to law firm are criticized, they 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 always always come out with the you know the the grand ideals of the profession of the legal profession, you know the particularly you know the the prestigious history um, of the legal profession as you know state elite after all, um, uh, as it was for the republic precisely uh, uh, in the late nineteenth century. But maybe I should stop. I've been already very long. Thank you. Um, that was fantastic. Um, and um, um, what I'll maybe do, unless, unless any of the panelists want to quickly respond and engage, is shift to the audience. Um, and um, audience members, you're welcome to type me or type us um, in the chat a question. 
um, or ask it verbally. And um, um, Susan Rose Ackerman, I will allow you to talk for a moment so that you can pose your question. Hi, so I know everybody except for the author. Uh, this is very interesting. And I, I, I got in touch, got your book through Thomas Perot, who I'm sure, Peru, who I'm sure you know. Um, so I'm about to publish a book comparing France, Germany, the UK, and the US in terms of public law, particularly rulemaking. Um, and so I find the book really fascinating. But of course, some of the things that you present as, uh, as disturbing and special echo what's been happening in the US probably for a century right now. Of course, the direction is more from the private to the public and back again, but once the wheel is rotating, where you start it isn't, isn't so important. But let me talk a little bit about what I've been looking most at, which is more the environment, all right? So this is a regulatory areas where the simple neoliberal story is not, doesn't fit, right? Isn't, isn't, isn't what's going on. Um, and um, in, in all of these countries that I've been looking at, um, that's an area where there is much more involvement, much more movement for public involvement, for public participation. Um, so it's a different, it's not the lawyers, it's private, it's people in the private sector who may have a, you know, a public, uh, public background, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly different complementary thing that's, that's going on. I mean, you mentioned that pact for the environment, which is a wonderful, you know, hybrid, what in the world is that? But um, the, the, the point is that within all of these uh, European uh, systems, those are places where there is a, a push to involve the public through something other than just elections, right? through bringing them into uh, to discussions. You've got organized uh, civil society groups that are involved. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you, how you think about the relationship between sort of other areas than corporate law <laughs> that, you, that you focus on and these other things that are, you know, that are going on. Um, my, my husband also wants to ask a question, so if he's, go ahead quickly. Hi, uh, this is Bruce Ackerman. I, I uh, uh, would like you to uh, comment on the uh, uh, struggle for power between the French and the uh, Germans uh, over uh, control of the European Union. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, basically, uh, the Germans, this European Central Bank is a uh, mechanism of German uh, uh, power. Uh, uh, and the uh, European Court of Justice is French. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, and uh, since 1870, after all, uh, we've had this struggle uh, uh, between the Republic and uh, um, the Germans. and. Uh, uh, and uh, the Germans, of course, uh, want to, uh, in, in, you know, on the first day of the 20th century, announce that their legal superiority over the French uh, and, and try to throw the Code Napoleon in the ash can of history. Uh, um, uh, and um, they uh, pretty much succeed until something happened in 1914. I am not quite sure what. Um, uh, and, um, and and then, of course, they got clobbered uh, in the Second World War, and the French uh, took over the European Union. Um, uh, and um, uh, and this is very much in the spirit of Mitch Lasser's latest book. Um, uh, 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 so we have, uh, and a good deal of this uh, privatization or mixed model, as it were, this shift in the aspiration of the French state and of all things uh, the present president is precisely an effort to, um, uh, 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 given the rise, you know, Germany was obliterated at, at the end of the war, uh, France was less so. <laughs> and the Fourth Republic was a great su economic success. <laughs> um, the um, uh, and so then we have then uh, this struggle uh, uh, between uh, uh, 
us uh, between these two powers, especially given uh, Brexit, uh, for hegemony. And France has this great advantage of not being threatened by the Russians uh, in a way that Germany is. Uh, uh, and that uh, is another great asset of the French. Uh, so um, uh, throw that into your uh, glory of the French state as the imperial power of, of the 21st century Europe. <laughs> a lot of different questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> these are very difficult questions. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> Well, I, I mean, I mean, starting maybe with the last, uh, the, the last one. I mean, there's a whole, of course, uh, story about uh, uh, about the French and the, the, the German involvement. That I saw earlier that Kieran Patel was uh, among the participants and is a, a you know great historian of the European Union. And um, and I mean, I guess he <clears throat> he would be better answering this question. <laughs> but I mean, of course, you know. If I get back to my, you know, the, the segment of French elite that I've been looking at, um, if you take the history of this top civil service, it's true that they, they have thought about um, the uh, European project um, from the 1950s onwards as a, a, um, a lever to somehow maintain uh, uh, part of their uh, uh, position. Um, by uh, um, transforming uh, the European project, um, you know, also um, as um, a project of um, an interventionist uh, state. Of course, they have in large part failed, um, particularly because the grand policy of the European Union is not the common agricultural policy, depend, you know, which of course by many standards resembles very much the sort of uh, a policy that the French state would pursue, which is in a, in a way protectionist and, and uh, pushing for, um, you know, um, protection against the market rules, etc. Uh, but the grand policy that is defining of the, Euro the European Union is competition policy, of course, and, and that was that one was essentially, historically at least, uh, framed in the 60s by um, a lot of uh, German older liberals. So, uh, but of course, the story is always very complex. Uh, each one of the institutions uh, of the European Union is taken into so many battles. I think today the European Central Bank is not anymore that much controlled by uh, German Bundesbank or by German economists. To a certain extent, actually, that's part of the problem because. Um, that's why the German Constitutional Court has somehow um, been critical about. I mean, this is at least uh, critical about the fact that um, you know German preferences were less and less taken into account uh, in the definition of uh, monetary policy. So you know there are many battlegrounds, and uh, um, <clears throat> and, and 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 of. I wouldn't, if I wouldn't define the ECJ, the Court of Justice of the European Union as a French, it's, it's a Francophone institution, but not a French institution, uh, which I, I guess is, is, a, is a bit different. But, um, but uh, I recently wrote a, um, a blog on the Verfassungs blog on the, I was asked to uh, answer the question, is there a German legal uh, hegemony, which um, of course is exactly into these sorts of, um, of um, of discussion, uh, and and then uh, uh, to Susan Rose Ackerman uh, on uh, uh, environmental law. I mean, I'm I, I, I'm no particular expert, but in a way that that allows me to bridge uh, also with what Sam initially said. Why did you choose law? And I think uh, or lawyers, and not maybe I assume uh, bankers or you know the banking sector of the state. Um, uh, or the accounting or tax. I think in a way, uh, law has this, uh, was it, and, I mean, apart from the fact that I've been working on law and lawyers for many years, so I somehow, I, I'm, I mean, my eye has been a little bit more um, acute, I guess, than for other types of uh, expertise and professions. But also, I mean, when it comes to the state, of course, law is a sort of cut cross, cut cuts across policies. And to see how law and law firms have become 
um, a place for uh, where uh, bureaucratic capital accumulated by top civil servants can or cannot be converted into the private sector, into companies or into law firms that have an interest in acquiring capital, uh, bureaucratic capital. So by looking at, you know, across policies and across ministries to these movings and to what extent uh, there is a demand for bureaucratic capital among uh, the private sector can, you know, allows it, you know, this book is just a beginning in that sense, but allows to map out the extent to which part, the parts of the state that are more neoliberalized than other parts of the state uh, for which the private sector has no interest in, you know, for example, the private sector has no interest in me, public researcher in political science, and I've never been offered um, any position in a law firm to so. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you very much for all these, you know, very nice discussions and, and questions. Wonderful. We have um, one question in the queue from someone who had to depart, but I'm actually going to jump in with a quick question that is, I think, reminiscent of um, some of what Sam was asking you and Katarina were asking you about. Um, I would love to hear you reflect a little bit more on your relationship to the term neoliberalism. Um, and I, I, I do so first because, right, it's a term that is increasingly critiqued for being a bit baggy and imprecise and kind of a catch-all that misses certain forms of nuance. Um, and as we know, at least in my crowd, that term embeds an epithet. If you call something neoliberal, that's not exactly a compliment, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's an accusation. Um, so I found myself wondering if there were some of the phenomena that you set out to analyze that kind of escape the orbit of neoliberalism. Um, echoing, um, I think what Katarina was saying, I found myself teaching contracts law for the first time this fall and found myself telling a story on a number of occasions of the, and I would not have expected to find myself telling this particular story of the law's need to catch up to the reality of business practices on the ground or the complexity of financial instruments, some of these new, you know, transnational exchanges that, you know, so, so the story of the laws lagging behind economic reality. Um, so thinking about neoliberalism, what is your, how do you feel about that term? I mean, does it really speak to everything that you're trying to study in the book? Are there some of these developments that you wouldn't want to condemn? as neoliberal. So I would love to hear you just speak a little bit more about oh, that. Um, I, I get all the, the hard questions in the end. Uh, <laughs> I mean, even harder than the other ones. No, no, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I think it's, it's um, I, I know it's, 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 a, it's one of these words, you know, that are difficult to use, uh, that, are, that carries so much, you know, political, ideological and you know and uh, sense and you know are full of controversies um i still think it's it's a good analytical uh, category when it comes to understand um the way um the making of markets uh the promotion of markets can become a state policy can become something uh, uh, that um, is a, a policy of the state uh, in uh, promoting and diffusing a culture of the market in the society. And, and um, in that sense, it allows to, to look at part of the reality of state transformations today um, that, uh, of course, um, I mean, that, 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 that is very interesting. And, of you know, I, I agree. Pro probably there are there are probably a variety. There are probably a variety of, of blends of neoliberalism, uh, and that's particularly complex. Maybe the, the one I've described here is one, uh, the one that comes with this sort of public spiritedness 
uh, and a sense uh, of justification in terms of general interest, which is not necessarily uh, the same as uh, more authoritarian uh, forms of ne neoliberalism as we can find uh, uh, in other uh, countries, uh, even in uh, Eastern uh, Europe. So in, in, in that sense, I, I agree that neoliberalism is a, you know, it's a difficult word um, and should always somehow be qualified. Um, but I mean, in a way I talk more about the neoliberal republic or I talk about the European and liberal turn of the French state. So in a way it's always taken in, in, in a story that makes you know, this particular blend of neoliberalism more explicit. I mean, at least I try. <laughs> Thank you. Mitchell, did you want to jump in? Did you have your hand up? Just a, a, a quick question for Antoine. So um, look, a, a huge amount has been written on the French state and uh, often in terms um, having to do with the relationship between the administration and politics, right? So the old, the old quip obviously is that um, France isn't governed, it's administered. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a well-known line because it actually captures a lot. Um, I wonder to what extent you would, um, you would accept uh, an analysis of what you're describing that basically what, what you are describing is just a reformulation of that. In other words, um, that now there's a triangle the triangle is the private, the administration, and politics. And it's just basically adding a third term to the equation as a way of continuing some kind of um, oh. governance relationship between the administration and politics. That, what's right and what's wrong in that? <laughs> I mean, I... No, I, I wouldn't say it's just uh, the same old story um, in that sense that I think that the moving in and out of the state has also transformed um, the conception of policy that these actors are in particular as ministers or as top civil servants. Uh, for example, a sense um, a new set, you know, a sense that um, uh, state intervention can be costly. I mean, the, is easily costly, or the sense that self-regulation of mar uh, you know, self-regulation um, is a, often a better solution. Um, you know, the the you know, a, a new sense of policy and uh, um, uh, preferences that is of course much more uh, marked by the experience of the private. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that, you know, it's just the state expanding, uh, you know, uh, expanding in the private sector. It's sort of, you know, uh, of course there is, I think it's a sort of mutual capture, a mutual capture of, you know, the state capturing the, 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 the private capturing the state elites and the state elite, you know, capturing, you know, a specific part of the, a specific part of the, of the business sector, who is somehow becomes obsessed by the public and by the state, you know, that's also one of the discoveries of the book is how, you know, the, the private sector is obsessed by the, by the public, by the state, by, you know, uh, developing, uh, um, you know, is its policy, in, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's firm also al alongside the, the state, etc. I see Katerina raise her hand. If I just may chime in. So I think this is a really interesting discussion. I mean, 
you could also say that you know the the French lawyers are have realized what many people maybe in this country are still rejecting is that actually the entire market is of course also legally constructed and public. So this is the old realist saying there is no distinction between private and public. It's all state law ultimately, right? And looking at it from the French perspective, we're basically having French elite lawyers who realize that you know that it's actually true. And they basically help it help make it happen and help sort of advance sort of the market side of things, but by reconfiguring the public law to make it. And because of where France came from, you have to do much more work at the public sector side than in the United, United States, where you get sort of the deregulation, it comes from the market, and people deny the role of the state. And progressives in this country have always said, actually, for, don't forget the private is too of the state, right? So it's a, I think sort of, it's both, I think a mindset, it's also um, uh, sort of a, in, in terms of a continuum from where you start, different starting points, but ultimately uh, we're fighting similar battles from two different directions. And I think what is beneath that is sort of a, sort of a you know, we need a reconception of what is a public sphere and, how do we configure democracy in an environment once we recognize that actually both the private and the public is of the state? It's, it's, it's of a common resource, which is ultimately of the people as the sovereigns in the ideal you know, demo democratic uh, framing of things. Uh, but I think also that needs to be rethought in some ways. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, probably, the, the, probably the interest of the of the of the French case in that context is of, of course the yeah the the, the, the the enormous work of rewrite of rewriting um, of rewriting the, the 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 administrative law in a context of competition where competition is um, you know the sort of uh, grand uh, frame in which the, the state is involving and its public utilities companies are evolving, et cetera. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, this is what, why the Conseil d'État is fascinating because it, it had to somehow reconfigure completely its utility, uh, its position with, uh, vis you know, with this history of, a, of, a, of an administrative law, which in a way could feel like a burden in the new context, the new European and neoliberal context uh, for France. So, I mean, this is why following the Conseil d'État is particularly, um, I mean, it has, has proved to be a particularly nice, uh, you know, vein of inquiry because this is where the most of the work of the reworking, also of the sort of narrative of the state and narrative of, of its role, etc., has been um, has been uh, undertaken, and that's. Um, that, that 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 has been quite uh, fascinating in in uh, in the research i think I'm... so um i think that we're we should probably call it a day um since i know some people need to dash off and teach and that kind of thing um but Thank you so much, Katarina, Mitchell, and Sam for these incredibly energizing con comments. Um, and thank you, Antoine, for this marvelous book and publishing it in Corpus Juris um, and for such a lively dialogue today. So um, and thank you, last but not least, to Mahinder for hosting and or helping us to organize all of this. So um, um, stay tuned for announcements for future Corpus Juris author events. Um, and again, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Liz, so much. Uh, thanks Thank so much to all of you. It was a great moment. Cheers. Have a great one. Bravo. Salut.